and welcome to another episode of 72 Pin Connector. With us today, we have Tom Webster. Howdy. And Adam Jordan. Hey, what's up, guys? How are you two fine gentlemen doing this week? Busy. busy. Very, busy? very busy. What's got you going? Oh, lots of work stuff as usual and, and trying to get stuff around the house taken care of. And I did manage to get a little bit of gaming in, but not as much as I would have liked. I have I'm still stuck on Ornstein and Smell for uh, for everyone who tunes in to me playing Dark Souls. And I apologize for not streaming very much this week. Is that I'm the boss not- you're playing? Is that the boss you were playing when I came over the other day? Yes. Yes, it nice. is. I'm I was actually going to ask, did you get any stream for the Dark Souls progress? Because I only got a little bit in this week. <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't stream at all this week, actually, is what I meant by not much, uh, just because I couldn't find time to sit down and dedicate. Like, and in the, the Dark Souls I did play, I was sitting and grinding, because there's an item that I want, but it costs a bunch of souls, so I'll go in and I'll kill like two or three guys, and I'll run back to a bonfire to respawn them, and then I'll run back and kill two or three guys. It's not really stream-worthy material, unless you want to hear me just talk about my day or recipes or whatnot yeah i feel bad i had that same spot at neo where i was like i want to get one more level before this boss so mm-hmm. i would just keep going shrine run out shrine run out and i like on the stream all i'm saying I'm like i'm sorry i know this sucks it'll be over <laughs> shortly because i don't need that much more <laughs> <laughs> but but sometimes i i i know that in dark souls you don't have to do that you should never have to do that i watched a dark souls run where a guy went through as a level one with a club like it, it's amazing. You can do that, but I'm just not that talented. So I <laughs> grind. It's easier not to. Yeah. Uh, so what about you, Adam? You been doing anything fun this week? Uh, working a lot. Um, last weekend. So that's technically part of the week since it was after the podcast. Um. We went to Arcade Legacy. We did go to Arcade oh. Legacy. The I old, actually, we, we, totally we were going to go to Laser we Tag. We were going to go to Laser Tag initially, but then I ate way too much, and we were just like, "Well, what if we just go to like an arcade?" So, so we so went to, to bring, Arcade Legacy to bring back the the seventy two food connector. Uh, what <laughs> what did you eat too much of last week? Oh yes, pho or pho or pho, however you decide to say it. D five pho thong. Yes. Oh my god, it was so good. Did you go to Lens? Please tell me. We did go to to Lens. Lens. We absolutely went to Lens. Where else would we go? Are you serious? Okay. So so. for for those for those of us who are less cultured than you are, could you explain what exactly pho is? Pho is a Vietnamese dish. It's a meal sized soup. So most places when you go and you order it, the bowl is you know, not a normal sized bowl at all. It's a this bucket, is like a really. it's you, yeah it's like a mixing bowl. You can wear it as a hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's filled with this delicious mixture of kind of like a sweet and spicy broth, uh, thinly sliced meats and noodles. You get egg or rice noodles, and then you know obviously a bunch of herbs and spices and stuff. So it's actually really cool because traditionally they will actually serve that with raw meat. And the broth is so hot that they pour into it, it will cook the meat. Yeah, because Man. they uh, slice it so thin. Yes. Huh. It's kind of like... I don't want to do that. I have a habit of spilling things. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like... I, I don't want to be cooked. Lemon curing uh, thin sliced beef. It's the same kind of concept. Yeah. Because it's so thin. But it's basically like the best food in the world. So yeah, it was agree. excellent. It's really, really good. I've been really disappointed since I've been out here at Seattle. I've tried a couple faux places and nothing yeah. compares to Lynn. Lynn's nice. is just so good. When I'm back there in May, when we have our uh, next yeah. in person 72 PC podcast, we are getting some motherfucking Lynn's. Oh, we have to. It's <laughs> and, so absolutely. good. And I, so good. I'm not big on free spots. spring rolls. Oh, the mm. spring rolls. That sauce with the carrots in it. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm not big on okay. free sponsorships, but for the love of God, anyone in the greater Dayton area, go to fucking oh. Lynn's. It is amazing. Lynn's Bistro. You absolutely have to. It's Off amazing. Of NHS. Off of Airway by Wright Pad Air Force Base. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
for, and I believe appearing just froze, so I, I apologize, um, at least for me. Um, yeah, just keep going. So you, I'll take care of it when it comes back. You, you ate way too much pho, so you couldn't yes. laser tag. No, uh, that would have so, been a very bad idea. Yeah, I can imagine. So we did end up going to Arcade Legacy, and would you like to, uh, would you like to describe where Arcade Legacy was? Arcade Legacy was in a mall, but Arcade Legacy is open later than the mall. So I guess they just kind of leave the doors open forever. Yeah, sort of. And you just kind of like, kind of, you go into the parking garage and there's nothing there and it's misty and foggy and you feel like you might get murdered on the way in. So and then you open up the doors into the mall and it's just nothing. Now, and, like not all the not all the lights are on. It is it's abandoned. Just, uh, yeah. This place has literally three stores in it. Arcade Legacy is one of them. And uh, it's it's a ghost mall. It is straight out of Silent Hill three. I was actually going to uh, paint this picture. It's abandoned. And then you realize it's still three o'clock in the afternoon because yeah. this mall. Oh, really? It only houses Babies Are Us. Arcade Legacy, and then the big thing that draws people in, the reason I'm there a lot, is Bass Pro Shop. Those are the only three active stores that I know of in this entire mall. Yeah, I didn't know that. I thought it was not, just because we were there late. No, no, literally, the mall is abandoned. Like, so, everything, oh everything being in almost disarray, but not quite. Sort of this weird, unsettling right. vibe. Yeah, that's yeah. because, literally, Arcade Legacy is one of the three stores using the mall. Yeah, and it's like I've been yeah. a Bass Pro to where normally you'd have the mall entrance. It's completely sealed off, so you can't get out there, but you can mm -hmm. see it, and there's no one there. This is the mall from fucking Dead Rising. I mean, I think so Dead they, Rising, and I look at this mall, I'm like, yes, this is it. <laughs> yeah. How do they keep homeless people from coming in and just like living there? Okay, so, so take that question, because I've asked myself that, and yeah. then think about it, right? Th think about just... The amount of terror or horrible, <laughs> awful things that would have to happen to homeless people to drive them away. Or, I didn't see any bodies, right? I didn't see any animals living there either. That mall is haunted. There is something <laughs> eating living creatures inside that mall. It consumes all that enter it. <laughs> it, it, is, it is the mall from Silent Hill. So, when you're pulling around, because it's, it's dark by the time you get there. Um, when you're pulling around, none of the parking lots have any lights on at all. So, it is pitch black like country road in the middle of the fucking night sort of pitch black mm -hmm. and then you get to the underground parking facility where the roof is dripping like this this <laughs> place is it's not in disrepair but it's not in good repair i guess it, it's yeah. certainly not tidy it's warm um, yeah and and then because you're underground and because shit's dripping everywhere there's this dense fog covering everything and the buzzing of like dying fluorescent lights that flicker every now and again, literally from a horror movie. And then you but have then, to walk past all the abandoned shops to get to the arcade. And then but you when you actually in, get it, the inside of the mall, though, is actually really nice. Like it's not, it is. it's not like this dingy building that's run down. Like everything inside looks nice. It looks like a mall that would be open during the day. Yeah, if you filled it with people and stores, it would look completely normal. But because it's abandoned, it hits this weird uncanny valley of, like, yeah. horror movie vibes. <laughs> that said, it is home of a really rad arcade. Yes, so, Arcade oh Legacy. Oh my god, I love Arcade Legacy. So Arcade Legacy, you can... What, you can go for an hour for, what, five Three, bucks? Three bucks, five something? bucks, something right. like and that. Then, or you can just pay $10 and stay as long as you want. And all the games are free. There's no tokens or quarters or anything like that. Uh, there's no card you have to load up with cash and swipe every time you want to play something. So you play all these arcade games for free. Is there um, pinball? I mean, do they have pinball? Yeah. Is there yeah, pinball there was, free? There was what? Three they machines? All free. Yep. There, there were three or machines, machines. So I'm yeah. used to the concept of free arcades, but you still normally have to pay a quarter or something for pinball since they're the oh, ones that need yeah. the most maintenance. Yeah. No, these are, these are all free there. Sweet. Yeah. So they've got a lot of machines and then off to the side they've got another room full of machines they're not using right now. So I think they rotate them out every so often. Yeah. A uh, lot of great games and one of the games we played was U-Beat. Oh my god. So 
So, so is good. a rhythm music game from Japan made by Konami. It is incredible. And, I had more fun with this than I did Guitar Hero. And see, what really yeah. bummed me out is you guys were explaining to me how much you enjoyed it. I looked this thing yeah. up. They attempted to make this in America two different times, and it never caught really? on. Yeah, I'm surprised. So when you guys said you guys were playing U Beats, uh, mm-hmm. that's why my next question was: Was it an import? Because it's named U Beat only in Japan yeah. because all the American ones died. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't import. It was kind of hard to navigate the menus and stuff. Everything was in Japanese. Yeah, but it's except, basically except the it's, word uh, level. The word yeah, level wasn't the word level. We that was the important part. Um, it, the whole game is played on this four by four grid of square buttons, kind of like a. Uh, I don't know how how to describe it. Yeah, like sort of like the face of a Rubik's cube almost. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, something it's like that. Four by four. Instead it's of four three by, by four, three. and the buttons are clear, and there's a screen underneath, so each button lights up, and it it'll light up red with a little animation before you would need to press it, and then you press it on beat, and then it you know if it if it blinks yellow, you got the perfect hit. If it blinks blue, you hit it, but it wasn't perfect. Um. Basically, all these lights come up and you have to hit them right on the screen. It's all played on that little grid. Uh, there's a little screen above it, kind of gives information, you know, like the song and that kind of stuff. But it is really, really fun. It's kind of like playing a, sort of like playing a piano. It's, it's kind of how you hit the buttons, but not really. Sort of, kind of. It's, <laughs> it's hard to explain without, without actually showing the video. And Which you, we will. Yeah, we, we will. We do have we, a video coming up for this. Yeah, we and and footage of the abandoned spooky Silent Hill Mall, mm. uh, which which you all will absolutely <laughs> love. But, but you, um, from the outside I, looking in, I would say the piano analogy was right. The way I watch you playing it, you look yeah. very much like piano, where when our other friend was playing it, it looked like he was playing a he huge, was smacking it. He was playing a huge touchscreen cell phone game. Where he's like tapping yeah. the fuck out of those with buttons. the index fingers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's it's interesting how all of us are playing the game differently. So so our our other friend, uh, you know, he's a drummer. He plays bongos. He plays steel drums. Like any type of percussion instrument, this guy loves. So he's like slapping stuff and hitting it and pounding on this machine. Adam's over there like fingering the ivories, playing the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he's he's playing a, a beautiful performance somewhere, and I am like going full programmer typing <laughs> on this screen. It it is so weird to watch someone play it because everyone's yeah. got their own individual styles, but you develop it over the course of playing this game. And we actually got, I I wouldn't say great. We we were nowhere near some of the people we saw there, but mm-hmm. we got pretty good. We went from you know the level one of. Hey, can you hit a button relatively on time to I think we're playing level sevens when we left something like that. Yeah. And the songs go up to level 10. So it's like a a level, you know, six basic and then like a six extreme and like a six. Yeah, absolutely nuts, insane mode. And and the levels sort of progress like that. And and we Mm -hmm. got to like the middle of seven. uh, And that's when we kind of capped out. But I think if we if we went you know, a couple more times, we could start yeah. playing some level tens, which are no joke. I mean, this yeah. is this is DDR levels of of uh, dexterity we're talking about. Well, there's levels and numbers, and then there's also uh, basic, advanced, and extreme. That's so I don't, I don't I don't know precisely exactly how they differentiate, other than you know what common sense would tell you. But there was some like. All right, this one's a level six basic, and then Tom played it, and he got through it fine, but it was still kind of like a hard one. But then he was also playing like level seven advanced and keeping up. But then like this other guy was there; he must have played it a lot. But we yeah. saw him, <laughs> we saw him playing, and he was playing like some of the top level stuff on extreme, and you're hitting like four buttons at a time. And he was just flowing over the screen, hitting all these things. And so the, the skill he ceiling was is very, very high on this game. So it looked like it might become a DDR, uh, Guitar Hero, Memorize Where the Colors Are Coming Up thing. Did it change or were those set every time? They it were was set. set, yeah. 
any game like that's got to be set. And yeah, any game like that is going to involve kind of memory. Yeah, to to some extent. I mean, the game um, doesn't I, have to be set. I mean, you're starting mm-hmm. to see an evolution of rhythm games now that are dynamic. I yeah. think you lose something with that, though, yeah, because uh, a, a lot of these games, a lot of the fun, and really the main reason I play rhythm games, because I was pretty heavy into the DDR scene back in the day, is because when you're playing these games, if you know what's coming up, you can get yourself into a flow. I, I love yeah. the, the trance mode of DDR, and I'm, I just suck at it today, but I used to be able to, you know, nothing crazy, but, you know, trance out, play the game, I know where all the notes are, I'm just jamming to the music and having a good time, and you be, you can do that same thing. If you couldn't memorize it, if it was all, you know, time and reaction, call and repeat, I think it would lose a whole lot of that element. See, it would yeah. very much disinterest me. You see, I like that element. Coming from a musical background, um, we used to have to compete in sight reading. So oh, I, yeah. I like the, you feel the rhythm. You know what the rhythm's going to be, the notes are new to you. You have to figure yeah. out the notes as they show them to you. I think okay. that, that that puts an actual mastery in knowing how to play the game rather than a mastery in memorization. Well, yeah, that's that's definitely part of it. But you could also just play a song you haven't played before. There's a lot of songs on that thing. Yeah, there's that's a true. ton. And given that it's an arcade machine and you can't just buy it to take it home with you or whatever so yeah true and it's not it's not with, like you're gonna well, I mean, memorize really, you, all of the songs on the whole thing you could it, it buy sounds, it but <laughs> you could yeah uh, i actually looked up the price um to get that specific machine they're about eight grand so they're they're not cheap that's not means. bad for an import though it's really not yeah, it's all not. things considered arcade machines are are really high up there in cost that's not like you're gonna pay mm-hmm. 600 bucks and get a nice arcade game um but I, I really think like the patterns, especially the, the set patterns of some of the songs, are really what bring out the charm in this game. There is a song uh, called Icicles or something. Yes, um, that's such a good one. And on this, on this four-beat pattern, um, it, would, it would just start at the top, and each light would light up going down in a straight row. Uh, but it would do that on one side, then the other side. So you knew every time you heard this part in the song, every time it led up to this one point in the song, you would have to prep to make your icicles. Yeah. Which was, it was pretty cool. It's, it's it was. cheesy, it's stupid, but it, it makes the game just a little bit more fun. It, it's yeah. nice polish. I liked a little bit of pattern recognition that was involved. I did notice that while playing. Like, these sections kind of be like this, and e- even just on a micro level, like, you know, you hit these two in a row, and then you hit a different one, and then you hit another two in a row, and then you hit a different one. You kind of you pick up that on the fly as you're playing. Yeah. So you go, you know, beat, beat, you've got a four, then another beat, beat, and then you can continue that pattern throughout the song. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely, you beat. If you can somehow find an arcade place that has one, if you live in the Cincinnati area of Ohio, you can go to the mall and check it out at Arcade Legacy. But definitely play you beat. If you get a chance, if you see that machine somewhere, definitely play it for sure. It's a lot of fun. So you guys were in an arcade. Arcades are almost a lost relic anymore unless they have a bar in them. What else did you mm-hmm. guys play? Because I mean, I've been there twice, and they've had some interesting games like the Tetris Street yeah. Fighter puzzle game and stuff like that. They puzzle didn't have wind jammers set up. They did no, not have uh, wind jammers. They didn't. I didn't get to play wind jammers, but uh, we played. Me and Tom played a little Marvel versus Capcom. Uh, we played. I don't remember what it was called. Some cyber mech fighting game that was terrible. Uh, yes. Yes, we did. Um, um, what else did we play? You guys played, played DDR. We played DDR. I saw Pinball. Um, uh, we did play, you and I played Die Hard, the arcade game, which yes. is by far one of the that worst games ever made. Die Hard it, arcade game is garbage. They made an arcade like, game? Yes, it's on the yeah. cut, it, but it wasn't actually Die Hard. Like, there's a tower and terrorists, and that's that's where the similarities end. <laughs> um, so it was it was right on the cusp of of hey, we can do 3D games now in arcades. So they got really excited and they decided to say, okay, let's make a beat 'em up game. Oh, let's mm-hmm. make it 3D. Oh, let's give people guns and hand to hand combat. And it just ended up yeah. being this absolute train wreck of the worst game design ever conceived. Important question. Yeah, it was, pretty bad. was it Christmas? 
No. You couldn't really tell. I don't think so. Probably not. Boo. Then there were no Santa hard. hats. No snow. It's not I, uh, I s- They do have a couple projectors set up in Arcade Legacy, and I, uh, I saw a couple, and by couple, I mean there was a ton of kids just absolutely destroying each other in Super Smash Brothers, yeah. which was just awesome. There were also um, PC setups with kids playing Minecraft. Yeah. Like, that does not seem like something I would pay to go do at a place. But no. arcade, arcade Legacy is weird uh, because it's not just an arcade. So they've got walls of consoles, walls of controllers, and walls of games. And if you want to play something, you grab a console off the wall. Most of them are already hooked up. But mm-hmm. you grab a game off the wall, grab some controllers, and just sit down and play literally whatever the fuck you want. If you want to yep. go play SOCOM on the PS2, get, grab it off the wall. I get it's, that. It's, but Minecraft yeah. is a very popular game going right now that you can play yeah. from the comfort of your very own fucking home. Right. I'm going there because I want to play Smash Brothers on the 64, because I want to do Wave Race 64, because I want to do Mario Kart for the SNES. Not because I want to play a game that I can do from home for the same price of nothing. Well, actually, True. so with, with Minecraft, I saw something really cool at Arcade Legacy, which was a bunch of kids crowded around a monitor, and they were all building stuff and, and yelling at each other and, you know, collaborating, even though one person was holding the controller. And that's something I haven't seen since, oh man, like the couch multiplayer days of the N64. I had a little bit of that happening with Terraria for the 360 because Tater and I were playing on the same screen. Granted, two different people, but it's not split screen. You're, if I remember right, it wasn't split screen. But even that, we were still playing a lot of times, just one of us. So there's a lot of the, hey, do this. You should do that. This would look cool. And I do miss that. Yeah. Good old couch multiplayer. I, I, did, <laughs> uh, I did get in some uh, 360 no scope, silent scope, which was good. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Every time it was it was a self-imposed challenge. Every time I shot someone, I couldn't look through the scope and I couldn't use the thing in the top left. And I had to do a 360 before I shot them. And I actually got pretty far. I got some some boss head shots in. It was, it was pretty great. <laughs> that game's actually really fun. I love Silent Scope. I really do. Silent Scope was good. I, I miss had that on like Dreamcast or something. Yep. I miss the gimmicks of the shooting games where they would model the guns really well compared to the gun you're using in the game. It was gimmicky as shit, but it felt fun. It felt good. It was so good. And then everyone went to the generic pistol. Except yeah. Time Crisis. Yep. Yeah. House of the Dead. The only one that didn't was the safari games or the hunting games where you shoot yeah. meerkats miles into the sky. <laughs> For an hour and a half for no reason. Oh it's not my even that God. great of a game. That is one of the most frustrating so games much ever. Fun. Go to Dave yeah. and Buster's, and my girlfriend utterly destroys me at that every time. Nice. It is bad. It is real bad. And then she um, wrecked uh, Vospec. Not Vospec. Dobby. She uh, wrecked Dobby, Dobby pretty hard on it, too. And then he, he got a little bitter. That was fun. That's right. I'm <laughs> nice. talking to you, Dobby. <laughs> so, so Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your list of. of games here and yes we do yes. believe it or not ladies and gentlemen we actually have a list of things that we should talk about because we cannot be trusted with the schedule um no <laughs> and i i want to know about some of these uh specifically firewatch okay firewatch i i haven't gotten very far into this i started it um i played it uh you know an hour here and like 30 30 minutes maybe the second session um not real far into it but the, the the visuals are really nice. The dialogue is incredible. They did really good voice acting for this. Um, it's kind of a walking simulator. You have to find stuff and do stuff, but it's pretty much walking around and it's a lot of dialogue interaction. But um, supposedly the story is really good. Um, I've heard great things about this game, so I'm looking forward to keeping uh, to keep going with it. So if you knew nothing about this game, where you're at right now, would you be enticed to continue? Uh, not necessarily. Like, I'm not, I'm not excited to keep playing it yet because I'm so early into it still. Yeah, but, but I mean, um, there, there's a point to me in games where it's early, so you're still yeah. excited because you don't know yet. But then there gets that turning point where after so far, you have to give me something because this is no longer a new game to me. Right. 
Has it reached that critical I'm, mass for you yet? Not quite, but it's getting there. Ooh. I think a lot of a, a lot of it is I already know that it's a good game based on reviews and what other people have said about it. Um, it also might just be that I'm not in the mood for it right now, which is a pretty big possibility. At walking simulators, you have to really you have to you have you to be in, be in a certain the right place. Mood. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been playing more action oriented games. A lot of you know, you're doing things all the time, and this is not one of those games. Walking simulators to me either have to be when I wake up drinking my morning coffee, or when I'm chilling yeah. down getting ready to go to bed. If it's yeah, in midday, that's when I yeah, mm-hmm. and I hate the term walking simulator, but that's what people call them. Yeah, it's. I, I enjoy wish interactive it. story would have caught on because interactive, interactive story, story is, is the what perfect, they are. Yeah, it's absolutely a better term. Um, other than Firewatch, I started playing Nuclear Throne. Okay, so I this, know nothing. This game is cool. Um, this was on the Humble Freedom Bundle. So if you want to pay $30 and get like 50 games, this is one of those games. Um, <laughs> it's really cool. It's kind of like... It's the the Binding of Isaac, Enter the Gungeon style game. Uh, primarily gun based. You have ammo. The visuals are similar, almost to like the original Legend of Zelda, but like a little better. Huh? Okay. Like it's got that sort of sixteen bit ish. Yeah, something like that. But um, it's got a really cool soundtrack to it. Um, some of the levels are kind of destructible in a way. Like there's some hidden hidden paths that you can explode and get like an extra chest with an item in it or something. Hmm. Hmm. But um it definitely plays a lot like Enter the Gungeon. You you know, you're moving around W A S D or use your mouse to aim and you can fire and whatever. It's like a twin stick shooter. Um But it's it's got that that super meat boy start the game, get right into it. There's no downtime. You know, when you die you just retry and it starts right back again there's no waiting around it's very much i want to play a game right now i want to have fun for a little bit and you play i love that That about i love that about like super meat boy hotline miami Mm -hmm. it's a fail fast go again fail fast go again Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. that's that's really really important in highly difficult games like those Mm -hmm. because uh, if it takes you you know a loading screen and then a respawn and then walking back to your place Without yeah. that being gelled into the fabric of the world, and I am mm-hmm. referring to Dark Souls and Neo, um, it's it would make your game very tedious unless you're trying to get the point of patience across. Yeah, that is one thing I will say about Neo. At least load times are not terrible. They're they're relatively that's, quick that's because nice. yes, you die a fuck ton. So Dark Souls there's... on the 360 was awful. PC is not so bad. <laughs> I've heard that. Um, there's stages, so it goes through like Isaac does with floors. You know, you've got your different stages. There is an end point that's, that'll show you on the end, like, you did not reach the nuclear throne, sorry. Uh, I have yet to get that far. <laughs> it does get fairly challenging. Um, but all, all your pickups are either health, ammo, or guns. And then when you complete a level, or sometimes every other level, uh, your guy will level up and you can choose a mutator, which is like a passive effect. Uh, it might be an HP bonus, it might be a new ability, it might be, you know, a higher chance to pick up ammo drops, um, you might get like a dodge roll kind of mechanic, or something like that, and and certain ones are for certain characters, and you get to pick from like four or five of those at the end of each level. So um, I'm going to have to try this out, the, seeing as apparently I own it. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, guns, are, the, yeah. are we talking guns in the... Fa- in the- way of they're just like AK versus M16 or are we talking like sci-fi each gun has a very distinct sh- um, shooting style yeah well there's actually there's some melee weapons too so there's like a screwdriver I think there's a sword a shovel I think I came across and there's like you know a regular pistol something called a slugger and then there's like a machine gun uh, there's a laser pistol I'm not sure what else. I haven't gotten super far into it, but it's kind of like regular guns, more or less. Okay. I was kind of hoping for like the Binding of Isaac tier effect kind of thing with guns. I haven't seen any of that yet. Ah, okay. Damn. But either way, really cool game. You can pick up and play if you've got 15 minutes to kill or whatever. There's daily runs too. So kind of like, it it is kind of randomly generated, so. 
That's a good thing for keeping people into a game. I was actually yep. just listening to Idle Thumbs. They were talking about the guy played um, Splunky for s- every day for seven months because yep. of the daily runs to the point where he would connect to shitty Wi-Fi at hotels just to do the daily run and then get off. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's incredible. I love Spelunky. I'm no good at it, but it's a very, very well-made game. It's a good game. Um, I got a couple checkpoints in. And then I lost my save because I rebuilt oh. a computer and I didn't transfer. Uh, yeah, that sucks. So, yeah, I haven't picked that back up. Uh, so, so I played Nuclear Throne and then obviously some Rocket League. And that's been my gaming week. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. Rocket League. I think we actually <laughs> did a little bit of Rocket League. Um, we did. Yeah. Yesterday. Last. Yeah, we streamed it even. I yeah. did not. On the Twitch channel. Yeah, getting some 72 PC Rocket League fun going on. Um, but also, on top of that, I continued my playthrough on Neo. I didn't get too much this week. Hoping to get a lot more mm-hmm. this weekend. Um, yep. Beat the boss I've been stuck on. Holy fuck. So, this dude's insane. I have this magical ability to reduce damage. And still, upon hitting me, he took three quarters of my health in one hit with reduced damage. <laughs> Wait, so this, he's not one-shotting you now. Well, I mean, he wasn't. Yeah. He still normally doesn't one-shot. It's just you get in a situation where if the attack hits you just right, not even just right. If it hits you solid, you get knocked down. And yeah. odds are mm. you're in there because you attack, so you're, your Kai is down. Therefore, you're stunned, meaning his follow-up attack will hit you and more than likely, will kill you. It oh yeah, that, that resource management is, is something else. So it took me a while, I finally got through it, and finally got my first full exposure to the, fir- the whole wo- uh, the world map. And the way that mm-hmm. they uh, set up their levels is really fun. So um, in each level, you have these little green guys you can find that go back to your shrine. At your shrine, you can choose an abil- a passive ability that sticks with you. You can only choose one out of the four. And each one of these green guys you find equate to a uh, power up in that. So if you find hmm. four of the uh, elixir guys, you then have a 5% chance of getting elixir drops when you kill someone. Oh, that's cool. Or maybe you found two of the gold drop ones. So now you have a 5% increase in gold or not gold, yeah, gold drops because you actually have a currency, then you have a level currency. And then um, when you go back to play, you can find all of them, but you can also go back to that level and switch it to a harder mission on that same map, which is something I thought was real interesting. They will reuse that map for a second play, pretty much. Hmm. Because this isn't an open world game, as in they don't have you run to points of interest. They just let you warp there pretty much because you go to a map view after each mission. Okay. So that's their way of getting around being, we're not open world, but we'll let you go back to the areas you've been. Um, that seems like a decent enough compromise. It's pretty, it seems pretty decent. Um, I finally have done some of the challenge dead people. So like when people die in the game, you see a red sword spawn in the, or stuck in the ground from where they died. Dark Soul-esque when it comes to that. Finally started to play some of them. I realized I was super high level for where I was at, and I was just wrecking them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but at the world map, there is the whole general store thing where you buy your armor. You can reforge armor. But they have this uh, combination of armor and weapons you can do. So if you like the ability of e- weapon B, but you like weapon C, you can merge them to try to get the power of one and the special effects of another. Hmm. <laughs> So it's kind of an interesting nice. combination as well as for cosmetics. If you like the way armor set A looks, but armor set B is a lot better, you can cosmetically change armor set B to look like A. There you so go. So just That's... because you like the way something looks doesn't mean you have to degrade your own performance. Guild Wars did that, and it, it annoyed me coming from WoW, because in WoW, if you see some guy who's glowing and shiny and you're like oh my god 
that guy just went through like a hundred raids just to put together that set, and he looks amazing. And you know that guy has spent his entire life reaching this peak of perfection that he will never attain again. And in Guild Wars 2, you look at someone who's got this amazing armor set, and you realize it's two bucks on the store, and underneath the cosmetic effect, it's the same cloth armor you're wearing. But th- this He's is level three. It's a little different here because, A, you're not getting it from someone else. B, you have That's to true. have it. So you have earned that armor, and then you're making something else look like. That's a good point. So it's not quite the same. Because you are, it looks like you have it means that you have it, or at least had it. Mm-hmm. You didn't buy it. You didn't give it given to you. But other than that, there's not much else I can uh, explain to the game I haven't talked about. I guess there's the jiu-jitsu stuff I can actually explain a little bit, though. Um, you can level up jiu-jitsu, which are um, the samurai special powers. So they come in... Um, right now I'm using a form called a shuriken. Obviously, throwing star. The um, way these work, when you spawn, you get eight of them. Every time you go to a shrine, they replenish. So this isn't something that's ammo-based. It's life-based. As long as you get back to a shrine, it recharges. It's almost kind of like magic. There's different things you can use for them. I haven't ex- explored any with them. But you get a certain amount of allocation. So right now I have five jiu-jitsu points. My shurikens take three. So I have two left. So eventually over time, you can have multiples of these equipped. So you can be using shurikens and maybe like, um, I don't know, maybe like a smoke bomb or something. And so that's nice. So depending on where you die in an area, you can switch up your loadout and approach it from a different angle. Yes. And okay. as they also have this with magic abilities. Um, you can, um, it's instead of jujitsu, it's called something else. But I have three points or four points in it right now. And every one of my skills take three. So I can only have one right now. So I get the choice between poisoning my weapon, armor reducing the enemy, or... Um, I can't remember the third, doesn't matter. So it's, it's a really cool system where you can do one super strong spell if you want, but you won't have enough left for any other side spells. Mm-hmm. And then if you die, you just go to the shrine and say, hey, I want to change up what I have this set as. And it's not ammo. Seems like a, a nice balance that they've built. Yeah, and it's not ammo-based. It's not mana-based. You just have a certain number you get each time you go to a shrine. So, and the way the shrines are spaced, it is kind of far. So, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to use it up. But if you're just rerunning yeah. for currency and experience, you'll know where you're going. So, you can just go guns ablaze and just kill shit with it. That's one thing I never, I, I don't like about Dark Souls, but I respect about it. All of your consumables are consumables. So if I waste a bunch of arrows and I don't kill the boss and he smacks me down, I'm out of arrows, right? If I throw a bunch of firebombs and I die, I have used those. They are gone. Oh, it's it's the same way in this. And don't get me wrong. I say the shurikens always come back and that they're ranged. These things don't do shit for damage. I mean, oh, okay. I'm in a really quick low stance, so it doesn't do a lot of damage. And I'm doing like 40 to 50 a hit. These shurikens maybe do 10. <laughs> what? Okay. And you've got, you've got eight, so you yeah. take out a guy and a half. Well, not even a guy. I can literally throw all of them <laughs> at one guy, and he's half health. What they do do oh. is they're strategic because they will help take down their endurance when you hit them. So when a guy doesn't have endurance, you can go up to him and do a final blow, which is a, an attack that does a shit ton of damage. Normally kills them, but not always. So okay. if you drain his endurance, you go up there, he's done for. So it, hmm. it is starting to feel like a Team Ninja game and not just Dark Souls, the samurai version, right? Yes. And that, that's okay. what I was trying to say earlier or last week, that as you get into this game, these systems are what define this as not a clone. The cloning aspect of it is what's going to be known as the Souls-like genre. It's not going to be seen as a cloning thing. It's going to be seen as a genre thing. It's the systems you build on it that are going to start defining these games. And this one is going to be defined, I think, as more of a faster, slightly faster combo with a deeper tech tree in the way the skills are working. It's, It's really cool. And they also have a really fun title system that I'm starting to discover. So they call it titling. 
If you get a thousand kills with a certain type of weapon, you get awarded this title. You get prestige points, and these points you can put into random stats that permanently stick with you. Like you get a 0.5% chance of hitting a critical hit, or you get a 0.1% increase in experience per kill. And it's just random. You always get to choose between four, and it's randomly what's there. So it's really cool to um, kind of see how these systems, you, um, they build on themselves. You get the perks from this, and you get a perk from your skill tree, and they just really complement really well if you do it right. That's interesting. Hmm. So it, it's pretty fun. And like I said, I'll still end up discovering more of this as I get into it later in the week. So, yeah. This this week, um, I have played very little, but, you know, I played a, a tiny bit of Dark Souls, uh, went back to uh, Link to the Past before bed, played that a couple of nights, didn't really get too, too far. Um, I did play some multiplayer Advance Wars uh, with, with my buddy who, who came over, um, and I love Advance Wars. I adore that game. I don't know what so, that game is. Really? really? Never played that? Oh, it is. It is wonderful. Uh, it is uh, honestly my favorite turn-based strategy game, even even more than Civ. Um, it is a turn-based strategy game uh, for the Game Boy Advance. So we were playing it on an emulator, putting it on the TV, uh, and uh, we were literally throwing the controller back and forth across the room because it's it's single system multiplayer, which is awesome for turn-based games. I love it when they do that. Um, and it's a very simple turn-based strategy game where you can create various units and, you know, this type of plane is good against this type of tank and this type of anti-aircraft is good against this thing. And it's a bunch of rock, paper, scissors in an environment where, you know, cities will give you defense bonuses, but mountains will give you better uh, vision range and uh, you know, being on roads or in rivers means you get no defensive bonuses, and it, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, but it's a really solidly constructed, not too complex turn-based strategy game. Um, it is absolutely worth it, especially if you're collecting old GBA games or you've got a DS laying around. Uh, it's a wonderful game. And the single player is just outstanding. Uh, the game's not too long, it's not too short. Uh, it's definitely one of the best values you can buy, especially as a classic. Nice. So, but I, uh, we, <clears throat> I decided not to use my my standard uh, turn based strategy format uh, or, or strategy, which is um, find the lowest cost unit that'll block a square and just keep mm-hmm. pumping them out and shoving uh. them into the map. <laughs> I, I go with those guys. It's a Zerg Russia. Russia equivalent of a turn-based strategy. I go yeah. full Russia. Just throw throw bodies at the problem until it goes away, <laughs> and eventually it does work. I mean, the, the the countless digital lives lost are are just uncountable, immeasurable, even. But I won, and that's all that matters. You could say that. Did you Other win? Is that, the actual question. Well, my people didn't win. I won. I'm just calling the shots. They died. Who cares about them? Um, <laughs> I did end up playing a game that actually is specifically built for you, Urk. Uh, Human Resource Machine. Yes. Um, it's, it's a game by the same people who did um, Little Inferno and World of Goo. Uh, it's got that same art style to it, the same musical style. Um... I don't like this as much as the other two. I think World of Goo was a giant, massive success um, in a wonderful game. Little Inferno was more of a toy box that I really regret paying full price for. I'm glad I got this in a bundle. Um, It's okay. Uh, It's it's a weird genre of games that are starting to hit now. Programming games, where you're literally putting together pieces of code to accomplish an objective. It's not bad. It just feels like I'm at work with a really shitty programming language. So I've got literally like six calls I can make instead of using all the tools I'm used to. So the first game I ever saw doing this is like hack and slash where you could actually get into the uh, units that are running around and reprogram yeah. them to do other things like walk off cliffs mm. and shit. Um, but this, um, I don't have it now. I bought the bundle. I've given the game to someone else. 
I want this game though. I want to play yeah. this game because it's, this game looks fun. It it is, but in that very cerebral programming way. And if you've never programmed before, don't be intimidated by it. It's uh it's very accessible. It does a very good job of of introducing you to the worlds and uh, it will give you an understanding, especially if you've never programmed before of, you know, uh debugging what uh you know breakpoints are how to mm-hmm. step back through your code how to find issues how to deal with edge cases uh and then there are these little bonus challenges that are optimizations so they say hey use less than 10 calls to complete this and you're like okay how do i structure my loops in order to get through this efficiently enough but i'm still not going over the call limit and then so I, I can do that fairly easily, but I'm using loops everywhere. Then the other optimization piece in a lot of these is, uh, you know, complete all of these in in an average of less than this many steps per batch. And then you have to make your code very efficient, even if you're using more operations. So it's almost turning the problem on its head and making you solve it three different ways to get all of the objectives. Very interesting. I don't know if it's fun though. I had I wasn't I didn't hate it. I didn't hate yeah. it at all, but to me it it really felt like work. It it's a puzzle game through and through when it comes down to it, but not in this cool, you know, tactile world of goo sort of way where I can, you know, build stuff and watch it crumble, but more in this cerebral I'm finding a solution to a problem that shouldn't exist sort of way. Um, the, the only downside I can say is in Little Inferno, in a world of goo, the story almost immediately grabbed me. There were, there were little things that, it's not the world's best story, but it was enough to keep me interested. It was, it was the breadcrumb trail that kept me going through the woods. In Human Resource Machine, I, that doesn't exist. You know, you are working in a soulless company, doing soulless things with very stereotypical business people. Uh, and everyone hates their lives all the time. And it basically just reminds you of real life. It, it's not really even a good parody because it's just too accurate. That's, I honestly don't know how I feel about this. I will complete it eventually. Uh, but yeah, uh, give it a shot. And um, we, we should probably talk about uh, how you can get this game. I think I think it's still on the list uh, for only thirty dollars in, in a wonderful humble freedom bundle but that will come after some of these other news items which i will i will kick it off to datum because he has got some yeah. funny hilarious microsoft shenanigans to share eric you've got gears of war 4 don't you yes i do sir did you download your 248 gigabyte patch luckily no <laughs> oh are you not one of the 10 windows 10 users that bought it no i'm um, windows 10 <laughs> but i'll let you get into this well the windows 10 version yeah. so um, I don't know how many people this actually affected, but there were some people who had a 245 gigabyte patch start downloading on the Windows 10 Store version of Gears of War 4. That is effing huge. That is my data cap in an update. Right. <laughs> Ew, data caps. No, but, I mean, 40... seriously, what the fuck? Yeah, I don't even think huge. my Steam library is that much space. Mine is, but that's, well, I've been yeah. collecting. <laughs> uh, so, that's, that's just so, insane. And as of right now, it looks like there's no, no news on what this is. This is the second time yeah. Microsoft has had this fiasco in two, uh, two or three months. The last time a developer accidentally pushed debug code out as production and the entire game got pushed as a patch with debug mode enabled. This time, the update is five times the game of the, the size of the game. But the only golden saving thing is that this did not hit all Windows 10 store owners. Yes. I bought the, I yeah, have thankfully. this on the computer. So I was potentially one of these guys. After I saw this, I went to my recent updates. It didn't have one. And I'm just thinking, dear God, I know what's going to happen. I open <laughs> up the game and it didn't happen. So, so I did so not wreck my data cap. With data caps, because I don't have them, because my ISP isn't 100% evil, just 95% evil. Thank you, Time Warner Cable. Um, Spectrum. You have, you have, I'm sorry, Spectrum. What, what, 
they're just fucking evil people. Evil people ISP number one. They're all the same. Um, but you have Comcast, the ultimate evil in ISPs. <laughs> um, so could you could you theoretically could an individual sue Microsoft for blowing up their data cap? You did buy the game. You uh, you might not be able to turn off automatic updates, but Microsoft fucked you because updates aren't supposed to be 250 no. gigs. If Comcast charges you overages, can you send Microsoft the bill? So two things. A, Comcast has um, data caps. They're not hard caps, and it's not a pay by the gig after thing. So okay. A, you mm. don't have to worry about that. I, I don't know of any ISPs that do that currently, and if there is, for fuck's sake, get away from them. Yes. Uh, Secondly, I know AT&T, AT&T Uverse did while oh, I had them. That is garbage. Oh, it was. But, that's why I left. But um, there, since there is a way to disable auto updates, I do not believe Microsoft would be liable. Hmm. Because in essence, by not opting out of the auto updates, you're opting in to whatever comes with it. Oh, I, I see. think that is the stance they would be able to successfully take. Yeah, that's true. That's if true. You have, if you have data caps going forward with Microsoft games, please turn off auto updates, at least for your games. Until they start doing this with Windows 10 and you end up downloading a 500 gig update for Windows 10. I'm surprised that hasn't happened already. So in case you didn't know, uh, there was some kerfuffle in the tech world because uh, a while ago, uh, before all the Windows 10, you know, pushing fiasco stuff, uh, Microsoft actually fired all of QA. Microsoft has no QA anymore. They're, they're quality assurance guys, the people that actually test this shit before it goes out to live customers. Uh, they're gone. Their jobs do not exist inside of Microsoft anymore. Their thinking is, well, because everyone's going to Windows 10, because we've got the insider program, because we've got beta users, they'll be our QA people for us. They'll let us know what's wrong. And then oh we've seen, you know, all I mean, literally the entire Windows 10 debacle, the, the forced upgrades everywhere, the class action lawsuit that's still going on uh, now Forza, now Gears. I, this shit is only going to get worse because Microsoft is too cheap to do their jobs right. And this is absolutely their fault. It's a good thing it didn't hit more people, but for fuck's sake, Microsoft, the shit isn't that hard. <laughs> yeah, they really got to do some more stuff to get around that. But Microsoft does have something good in the news. This PC Master Race having an exclusive mouse and keyboard is going away, potentially. Um, I, it was one of the Xbox higher-ups in a um, reply to a tweet hinted at the fact that after the Halo Wars 2 launch, that they may be bringing uh, mouse and keyboard support to the Xbox One. I have very nice. mixed feelings about this. I have very, very, very mixed feelings about this. Mixed. Why is that? So, okay, on one hand, mouse and keyboard is the ultimate control scheme. Uh, it's, it's perfect in just about every way, because if you can hear this, podcast listeners, I don't know how you wouldn't be able to hear this. That is the sound of perfection is a buckling <laughs> spring keyboard. Now, now over here, uh, and I, I apologize because this is video, uh, we, have, we have a controller. And, and as you can hear, those are buttons, right? This isn't as good as that. So if you're playing a shooter, if you're playing Call of Duty on your Xbox, and you have the option to use the perfect mouse and keyboard control scheme as opposed to all of the plebs using their hunks of plastic in their hands, you are going to wreck everyone. You, you have just now, because of adding a brand new control scheme, you have split your people down the middle. Unless every game is going to implement this, this digital divide between you know, controller using people and keyboard using people, we see this in PC games today, because in most PC shooters, you have the option of playing with a controller and hating life, or using a mouse and keyboard and having a decent time. I don't see this doing good things for Xbox Live. Let's put it this way. They can still disable it. The games themselves can turn off console native support if they want. Right. What this allows you to do is games have the option to enable it if they feel a need. I see this I is only good. This is only good and the evil can be turned off by a setting from the developer. I don't yep. know why a developer would even enable this, though, unless they say hey, it's going to be exclusively mouse and keyboard. 
Because why on earth would you segment your audience like that? Why would you unbalance your entire multiplayer arena by allowing both? Well, also multiple reasons. You may not be a multiplayer game, and it could just be better in mouse and keyboard, but some people don't like that. Halo Wars is also a game that is very, very much a mouse and keyboard game, even though it is very well mapped to a controller. And you might just not give a fuck. Because you know that there's going to be such a small player base that actually uses mouse and keyboard that it's not going to give you a real issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's still a question of whether or not they're going to do it. I don't think they're going to, specifically for developer concerns. Um, if they do, it's going to cause some interesting problems, which would give us more stuff to talk about on this show. So it's not all bad. Um, I, 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 it just it, The gut instinct just says no to me. Um, I love the idea. I mean, the Dreamcast had mouse and keyboard support, but the Dreamcast had a literal keyboard controller with, you know, both sides of the controller were Dreamcast keyboard or Dreamcast controller. And then in the middle was an actual keyboard. Uh, It was used for Fantasy Star Online. Fantasy Star, dear Lord. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. So, uh, Adam. You've got yes. some Rocket League news. Rocket League has just been killing it recently. Yeah, they have. So so with this new patch coming out for the, the Hot Wheels DLC, which we've talked about in the last cast, um, they're adding PS4 Pro support. So they're, they're adding 4K support on the PS4 Pro and with a consistent 60 frames per second as well. So for the 12 people this affects, this is fantastic news. For the rest of the you, you either... people. I really don't know, but you have to have a PS4 (laughs) and you have to have a 4K TV. I mean, the segment of the PlayStation audience, that is not that big. But Mm -hmm. either way, that is actually really cool. Yeah, and even if you're not playing at 4K, it's still, it's going to run better. So, so any, that's good for sure. And I'm sure if they haven't already, that probably means a 4K uh, textures will be pushed to PC as well. I'm assuming at some point. That's what I want. I think it. I think it already has them. Okay. I don't um, have a monitor that can handle it, so it doesn't matter, but I'm just assuming it should be there. Yeah. And, it, and it's also saying in this article that uh, 1080p, 60 frames per second on a standard PS4. So, so even if you have a regular PS4, you should see a bit of a performance upgrade. That's wonderful news. And anything to, to keep that ball rolling. I, I know that they... They love Rocket League, but I'm honestly surprised that in this age of pump it and dump it game development, how much love and care is being put into Rocket League. Yeah, they're Uh, really doing it right. We'll get on that later, because I got something to talk about on that. Yeah. Uh, So, Tom, I um, saw that one of your favorite walk around and do random ass shit in town for no reason games got an update. Uh, yes, the, the game that, that I, I have not been banned from, but my phone is no longer eligible to play. Uh, Pokemon Go is finally getting the Gen 2 Pokemon uh, that launched uh, last night sometime, I believe. Um, so yeah, you can now catch all the Gen 2s from Gold and Silver. It's great. I don't think it'll bring too many people back to the game. I think Niantic launched a little too early and, and kind of, you know, burnt out they, they were definitely you know fireworks and not a candle they don't <laughs> care because those fireworks lit up like a million candles yeah i know it, it i like the idea of pokemon go but I, I am a little jaded because i have a phone with a rom I, I don't root i don't do anything i just like controlling my own software because i'm a communist um and I'm not allowed to play Pokemon Go for reasons. Even though, even though on the Android emulator for development that I have on my PC, I can spoof GPS and play Pokemon Go, and no one gives a fuck, right? So I, I, think, I think the disparity there is, is really, it's really telling. Just because you run a ROM doesn't mean you're, you're cheating the game. Because so you can do that with anything. Also coming up in the future for Go, they are adding, um, supposedly be adding trading and potentially PvP battling. I think that's what I saw. But, you see, hmm. I, think, I think that would have kept people in the game longer initially, because right now, everyone I know, they're like, oh yeah, Pokemon Go. I guess maybe if I'm walking somewhere, I'll launch it. But it's, 
it doesn't drive people the way it used to. It was mm-hmm. incredible when it first came out. I work in a city where people don't look at each other, let alone talk to each other. And people, random strangers, were coming up to, to us on the street saying, Hey, man, there's, there's like this thing over here but near that truck. You should, you should head over across the street and grab that. I mean, look at this. It's got great stats. It's like, holy shit, man. And like we would compare Pokemon and, and trade tips. And it was just fucking rad. And team up to take yeah. down the fucking blue team. Fuck those guys. <laughs> team Valor for yeah. life. Yeah, it definitely seems to have lost its buzz, though, didn't it? It really did. It crashed pretty hard. Yeah, but even the random spawn ups every once in a while are still making them a ton of money because that had a higher adoption rate than almost any other app that's ever hit the store. That's true. Yeah. So there was got- also some Nintendo news not related to mobile. Hmm. Um, they, well, I shouldn't say they, an unnamed retailer has fucked up big. The Nintendo Switch is in a customer's hand. And it's not a customer like a mom who gives it to a seven-year-old. It's a customer who knows how the internet works, made videos, and showed the internet what this is all about. <laughs> so there oh, wasn't this a, is great. There wasn't a whole lot of big news, but um, I think, I remember on top of my head, you could see the available hard drive size is something like 29 gigs. There was a me Ugh. menu, so it looks like the Nintendo Miis are still going to be around for this. Uh, setup looked easy. Screen looked great. There was nothing necessarily bad. Just some real tailor really fucked up, and you got roughly thirty gigs of actual internal space to use. Hmm. Uh, so that guy's it, having a great time, though. Very yeah. And some real telling retailing chain once discovered what happened. Managers getting in a lot of shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But I mean, it's not too far off. It's what a month out at this point, less than a month out. It's not a, it's not a huge deal. Um, yeah, it isn't. But that said, I would love to have it early right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, other news: Resident Evil Seven, a game I'm looking forward to playing, has a second DLC pack out, and it's only been out for three fucking weeks. What the <laughs> shit? So yeah, wait, 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 volume let's, two. Let's reiterate that it has its second DLC pack out. Yes, this game has been out for three Good weeks shit. and already has thirty five dollars worth of DLC. <laughs> I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's pretty much a bad thing. So. We we wanted to have a group topic specifically because of this Resident Evil news and the stuff coming out about the Switch and there's there's a bunch of stuff going on in the world of DLC and we wanted to talk you know pluses minuses the the realistic industry perspective as as we understand it uh, what developers feel about it how retailers feel about it. Uh, it's not going to be just a, a two minutes of hate on DLC, but we did want to jump in because I think personally that this stuff is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and become a, a bigger part of gaming going forward. Uh, and we should probably talk about what we're in for. And not all DLC is bad. It's just this right here is an example of something that I don't like. I understand that there is now this really weird thing where everyone's hooked up to the internet. Your games are online. You have a two-month window between when you call game complete and when the publisher pushes it out the door. You're not firing your staff for two months, or I'm at two-month period, sorry. You're not firing your staff for two months. So what are you going to have them do? You're going to have them churn out content for this game that you can now push to them soon as the game comes out. And so I, I've, I've got... Yeah, go, go ahead. I, I will rant here in a bit. I was going to say, <laughs> I don't have an issue with having DLC early on like that. What I have an issue with is you charge for DLC out the gate. If you worked on stuff before the game came out, fine. I just bought this game. Give me what you have. That includes what wasn't packaged on the disc. That is I, my big beat. <laughs> I have got pretty mixed feelings about this. Um, so on, on one hand, you're right. Uh, what takes so long 
is especially on on PC. It's fairly easy most of the time, depending on which which store you're releasing on. But most of the time for PC, you build a game and you release the game. That's it. Um, for consoles, way 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 different story. Uh, it, for each console you release on, you have to go through a console certification process where you ship your gold master. That means that you said, this is the game. This is the exact thing that will be released to customers on shelves. So your game has to be finished, complete, 100%. Here's the disc that we're going to make all the copies from. Ship that to Microsoft, ship it to Sony, ship it to Nintendo, and say, okay, Please certify this so we can release this on your console. They will take anywhere from a month to two months to review it, to try to crash it, to play through the game, to make sure there are no big game-breaking bugs. Um, and, and now, with Sony releasing you know, the PS4 Plus and Xbox releasing you know, whatever their 1.5X system is, uh, that testing is now going to leak over to those platforms as well. So there's going to be even more time dedicated to this certification process. That means... During this one to two month window, your developers are sitting on their hands doing absolutely nothing. Now, one school of thought and the generally accepted, I'm not going to call it excuse, but reason that DLC comes out on day one is because, hey, during certification process, we build shit and we want to sell it because making games is fucking expensive. Paying all these people is fucking expensive. And our return on investment after the publisher takes a cut, the console takes a cut, the retailer takes a cut. After everyone gets their hands on a pie, we get a very small slice. I get that. I understand it. Day one DLC pisses off enough people that your programmers, when you ship a game, they are not bugless. If you've ever played a Bethesda game, you know this all too well. <laughs> um, when you ship a game, you ship your bug list too. You say, hey, these are the known shippable bugs. You, you don't send it out to people, but you as a company know, hey, yeah, there's bugs in this shit, but these are the ones that we are willing to live with through a launch, right? We'll get them eventually, but they're not high enough priority to cancel a game launch date. Mm -hmm. um, so you ship out known shippable bugs. During that one to two months, Go through your bug backlog for fuck's sake, especially you, Bethesda. Fuck you with your horse armor. Go through and make a. I mean, people do complain about day one patches, but I would much rather have a day one patch full of bug fixes than day mm -hmm. one DLC that I've got to pay 10 to 15 bucks for. Right. At least I know I'm getting you know, some sort of tangible benefit <laughs> out of it. And I, I don't have to plunk down even more goddamn money the first day I have this game in my console. But it's not necessarily black or white one or the other the, the people that are building the dlc right. are not the same people fixing the bugs as well as the bugs really shouldn't exist this is a product of us setting release dates far too fucking early because of goddamn stockholders but i digress but there's that too <laughs> i mean that's that's a capitalism problem that's that's yeah. not really going to be solved by the games industry at least i, I don't imagine it will if, if it does like if valve comes through and they say hey this is now communist utopia time everyone gets games according to their need and everyone builds games according to their ability then i will be super happy but mm -hmm. i don't think that'll happen and then everyone dies of cancer because everyone's going to games yeah that's that's <laughs> fine that's fine at least we got games but i don't know how i feel about this i i hate the idea of day one dlc i understand why it's a thing um, and there's also, I, there's an entire extra credit series about DLC that I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic, because it's by game industry people talking about this problem. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also the issue that, you know, when you get a game, you buy it, you're super excited. It's the best thing in the world and you want to have all the content right now. So the graphs on when people buy DLC is within the first week. That's where the majority of your sales come from. If you don't get them the first week after they've bought your game, you are never seeing another dime from them. So if you want to sell DLC at all, you have to release it then. Now, of course, there's the obvious edge cases of, well, Team Meat didn't do that with Binding of Isaac, right? They, they have released amazing consistent dlc when it was fucking finished and not a day before mm -hmm. a couple times now to huge massive success 
That said, they're an indie studio. They've got much less development cost. And more importantly, they don't have stockholders. They don't have people yelling at them to get these games out the door. Uh oh, I, I think oh. I think you might be on mute. God damn it! I fucking hate that button. <laughs> I need to rip that son of a bitch I was, off. I was watching you trying to talk. I'm like, uh, uh, I know you're trying to say something. Technical difficulties, I know Comcast, you're trying please. To say something. Nope, mute button. But That's so, funny. um, you you hint around the topic or one of the big topics here is yes, you need to have content or you need to have purchasables i think is the biggest thing to say day one you don't need mm-hmm. to have the content publishers are realizing that content is not always available day one but there is something that is available to buy normally for 40 or 50 bucks that'll cover you for a year the development of the season passed i remember my earliest encounter in this would have been probably around 2012 with borderlands 2 i Devel- hate yeah this. i don't like this at all you see, if you're going to have DLC, I'd rather have a season pass than really? just random ass DLCs I have to buy. I would rather be I able to say, disagree. give me 40 bucks and give yeah. me all of the DLC you make this year rather than have to so, buy each individual so one. Here's my problem with that. You're already paying for something that you don't even know exists yet. First off, I'm sure they give you an idea of how many DLCs you can expect, but you don't know what they are. Are you even going to be interested in them? This was the problem with Bioshock Infinite. So Bioshock Infinite had a season pass in most of its DLC. There was one really nice piece of DLC. The rest mm-hmm. of them were absolutely forgettable. So you paid an entire full price. You basically plunked down a pre-order. Mm-hmm. And, and this is why I'm 100% against pre-orders unless it's for a physical object. Is is because you're literally paying for an unknown. This thing that you bought, that you pre-ordered, could be absolute dog shit, but you already plunked down the cash, so you're shit out of luck unless you cancel. Well, it's it's a double-edged sword on some of these. A, I only do it for multiplayer games. B, Mm -hmm. it is also a developer's gauge on how much interest there is for more content. So without the backing of it, you may not get it. But with complete backing of it, you could get amazing. With Borderlands, it was 30 bucks, you got $40 worth of DLC. So you save money by doing the season pass, and they were all really fucking fantastic expansions on the Borderlands 2. But in the case of Bioshock, you plunk down the money and you get, you know, two more hours of decent content and then six more hours of very, very, very mediocre content. And that's why I stay with, I don't don't do it on single player games. I don't find the desire for a single player game. Because single player games, you better like the story. So I'm going all the way through and then I'm going to wait. Multiplayer games, I know I'm going to want those new maps. I know I'm going to want to keep playing with people. Like COD. I, I really, Call of I Duty, really you like... know that they're going to have map packs. And if you don't get yeah. the maps, you are now actually limiting yourself in the amount of matches you can play. The, the way Call of Duty does it is absolutely the wrong way to do multiplayer DLC. Because you are splitting your segment. You are yeah. splitting your, your multiplayer base, which is the wrong way to do it. The way Counter-Strike does it, which is very, very nice, um, is, you know, they've got a beta period period for these maps. And they're, I, I struggle to call them map packs because they hit the main game after a little bit. Um, but, you know, their map, so-called map packs, are like, you know, eight bucks, maybe, maybe ten bucks. Mm-hmm. And it's not that you won't ever be able to play those, because if if you are partied up or or the map switches to one of those, you will go into the game and you can play that. You just can't select it outright. It, it avoids splitting your community, uh, but at the same time, it gives the people who really want a, a first look at these maps, who are super competitive, uh, or who will just want to support the game, the ability to chip in a little bit. And it also helps that these, these things are so cheap. I mean, paying 20 bucks for something that might be shitty in Bioshock or, or a COD map, eh. Ten bucks well, for a whole slew of them? Not bad. That said, it is Valve, and they print money through Steam. But mm-hmm. you also have to remember that COD doesn't have to worry about splitting the player base. COD yeah. is the most populated online game out there, or one of the most. I don't know if it actually is, but I know it has probably a const- used to have a, always over a constant 100,000 every hour. Didn't matter if it was yeah. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., at least 100,000. 
So the segment into the player base is not something that they really have to worry about at all. Right. And they're giving you three, four maps for I think it was like 10 or 15 bucks. So it's not a bad price. It's really not. I wouldn't call it a bad price. I'd just say comparatively more expensive than their competition. Um, I, I do want to talk about DLC. Most DLC is, I would say, worthless to the main experience of a game, right? Bioshock Infinite, Rocket League, Dota, Call of Duty, Counter-Strike, um, Wolfenstein, all, all these games that have DLC, if you don't buy it, you're not missing out on much. But there is the really nasty problem where a, a publisher made of pure ultimate evil releases DLC that is core story content that was plucked from the completed main game as a cash grab. And I am referring to the Prothean in Mass Effect 3, because fuck you, EA. <laughs> this was core story content locked behind a paywall because EA wanted to grab more money from people, and that's just not cool. That's absolute dog shit. Where, where you, take a, you, you take your main game, and the, the vast majority of games aren't made this way, right? I'm not going to throw the vast mm -hmm. majority of developers under the bus, but in EA's case, they took a full, complete game, and they chunked out segments of it, and they said, and you're going to pay extra for this thing, you're going to pay extra for this thing, this thing's going to be tied to a goddamn laptop sleeve, so you can't get this gun or this armor unless you buy this physical piece of shit that you're going to throw away in two weeks anyway. Fuck EA. That is some of the worst business practices I've ever seen, some of the most anti-consumer DLC practices I've ever seen, and mm -hmm. I fear it's only going to get worse, especially from them. This is why I'm not going to buy Mass Effect Andromeda at launch, because they're going to do that same shit. I'm going to wait for you know, the complete edition to come out after six years when they have all three games <laughs> with everything bundled in it. Right, right. This, this is why I don't buy games when they come out, because I'm going to sit back, I'm going to wait for Game of the Year edition, I'm going to wait for Director's Cut, I'm going to wait for the, hey, we actually have the full fucking game in here disc, and then I'm going to buy that one. So was the, the plucked content you're talking about the ending of Mass Effect 3? No, no. The ending came okay. about because people threw a hissy fit That's for some reason, and, and then they made some free DLC. So okay. it was a okay. free fix. No, the Protheum was okay. like before launch, you could buy this piece of content, which was gotcha. later patched into all the pirated versions. Thank but you, you see, pirates. DLC is not always this monstrosity evil thing, though. I mean, DLC no, actually does amazing things for games. It allows what I think the next evolution of gaming is going to be. It's no longer going to be the iterative cycle of COD every year. It's going to turn into what Destiny has done, what WoW has been doing. And honestly, it's the, for a while, Destiny, it's the expansions. You have a core game and you buy an expansion and now it's all this new game. The game is going on now for, what is it, four years. Destiny's still going strong. It actually but got strongest after a couple of years being out. That's, mm -hmm. that's a, a core difference, though, because we've always had those, right? We've always had expansion packs, which are, are huge pieces of, of gameplay and content and patchwork bundled up into one thing, and they used to sell them on shelves, right? In mm -hmm. some cases, in WoW's case, they still do. Um, I really this want to separate the idea of expansion packs and DLC because they serve fundamentally different purpose. The transport medium may be the same, right? You don't go out to a store and pop in Destiny expansion pack number three, right? You, no, you no, no, buy no. it as a DLC pack. Yeah, this is DLC. You buy Destiny as DLC. Right, right. But what I'm saying is functionally, it's not horse armor. Functionally, it's an expansion pack. And no, 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 no. That's why I'm trying to get you to understand. DLC is not always this nasty thing like Mass Effect. See, what you're hating on for Mass Effect is still DLC. It's added story. What's mm -hmm. happening with Destiny is added story. It's, it's what's happening with, with, um, with uh, Borderlands 2 is added story. This is part of the evolution of DLC. It's no longer these mm -hmm. little trinkets and things. DLC is evolving with the game industry. It's allowing no, these no, games I, to stay alive. There, there, are, there are very good actors with 
DLC, I'm not using DLC as the transport medium. My my difference mm-hmm. is DLC are small, little contained things, you know, usually uh, a $5, $10 purchase. Expansion packs are vast chunks of content that, sure, you download in the same way you would download horse armor, but they serve fundamentally different purposes. Expansion packs in Destiny and WoW are mostly because those games are supposed to be MMOs, right? And, and uh-huh. they serve entirely different purposes than someone taking pieces of story from Mass Effect and removing it and then selling it to you, and then someone making Destiny and said, okay, here's the next chunk of the story for 20 bucks, right? It's, it's Half-Life Blue Shift and Half-Life Opposing Force as $20, $30 expansion packs continuing the story of Half-Life, which I think is absolutely fine. I love expansion packs. I buy expansion packs. I, I bought, you know, Wolfenstein The Old Blood um, as it basically an expansion pack to the new order because that mm-hmm. game was very good. So what's the difference between an expansion pack and the DLC storyline for Bioshock Infinite? So with an expansion pack, I would, I would expect, I wish there was a quantifiable way to put this down, but Bioshock Infinite, you know, their, their DLC packs were one and a half, two hours, depending on how you played it. Uh-huh. And, and it didn't actually continue the, the main quest it was sort of side shit and they were very which is what made. these other things do no no <laughs> it's the same destiny. it's the same thing that destiny stuff does it's not the main do, story do, it's whole do, new do shit do you play do you play wow have you have you ever played wow the the wow expansion packs are giant massive areas they have released continents on these on these expansion packs they've released uh you know new races new abilities uh, not to mention gear and raids i mean they're their entire, you know, thirds or halves of a brand new game that they're chunking down at one time. And Destiny has done mm-hmm. that same thing, right? What Bioshock Infinite did is they said, hey, we're going to give you another level. Uh, okay. It, it, would be like, it would be like if WoW charged 30 bucks to, to give you one new raid, which they have never done, and I don't think they ever will because, believe it or not, Blizzard actually believes in quality. But so uh, is you, is uh is your main problem then with the price compared to the amount of content you get then? Uh in in some cases, I think if I would be less upset about BioShock Infinite's DLC if it cost 10 bucks for everything. The fact that they cost, you know, 10 bucks a piece give or take is it, probably an issue. Now, 30 bucks for the amount of content you get in an average WoW expansion, holy mm-hmm. shit, that's a fucking deal. Uh Destiny, I think is right on point with what you get by buying it. Wow's yeah. fifty bucks in expansion. That's fifty. Still, that's I mean, it's it's wow, right? It's I still think it's a good deal then. But then again, I'm the guy who would pay to play WoW. So yeah, I, I pay to have my life sucked away from me violently. So so how long was the the Bioshock Infinite DLC? Like Burial at Sea is is the only one I'm kind of familiar with. Like I know what it is anyway. <laughs> not uh, not long. How, how long did it take to run through that? Not not long enough. So you're just so to you the main differential between an expansion pack and DLC is how long it takes to get through it. No, it's it's quality really. Um, so with with some games, it's it, this is this is sh- so shitty because if you base everything on time, right? The Binding of Isaac's new DLC. If you if you say, okay, well, I'm going to take the average length of a run. Okay, I died in 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds worth of DLC. <laughs> this is shit automatically. It, that, it doesn't really work that Translate, way. Translate, yeah. Um, but there's, there's such a, a breadth and a quality of the content you get, right? Skyrim could release a whole other Skyrim for, for 50 bucks, and I probably wouldn't pay for it because it's going to be an empty world full of shit I don't care about. I'm probably in the minority for saying that, but I, you know, I put my 40 hours into Skyrim and I was done with it. I don't, I don't care about more because I didn't feel like the quality was necessarily, you know, up to par. Uh, that mm-hmm. said, if Rockstar put out a, you know, a new third of GTA V and they said, hey, it's, you know, 50 bucks, go buy it. I wouldn't have an issue with that because I know the kind of quality I'm getting. Well, what I was getting at with that question is like uh, the first quote unquote DLC for the Binding of Isaac was, I think, honestly, it was over a third new weapons, new levels, new enemies. It is what you would. It's what you're defining as an expansion pack and not DLC. 
That's what I'm saying. There is no differential. It's just people have a stigma because it used to be expansion because you used to not be able to download them. You had to yeah. actually have a disc to do it. They called it expansion I, I disc. So. I, now, I don't think so. I just, 100% just think the fact, so. The fact that you download it, because people don't complain about Destiny's downloads. They don't complain about Destiny's expansion packs or DLC or whatever they want to call it. They don't complain about it. Right? Mm-hmm. The, the only thing they complain about Destiny in is, is the shitty loot cave where they figured out how to game the, the game zone systems and, and bypass a lot of the content by sitting and grinding and doing boring shit for a couple hours. Um, the, the, I think the issue is all of this low-quality shit that we're being expected to pay for now. Well, and that's uh, and, and what not, I'm not, now. not to mention, Resident, it, you know, games that you know, have built up a lot of hype that have just come out have now got two separate DLC packs. It's an additional 35 bucks on top of the 60 you just paid. So you're differentiating yeah. DLC from expansion packs from what you like and what you don't like then. Because you're saying it's DLC, yes. so it's shit, and expansion's good, so it's not DLC, only because it's good and not bad. I think I think mainly Tom is saying that there good are DLC that are is totally fine, but developers need to stop just pumping out less than ideal content and charging too much for it. Is That's what he's probably a, a more succinct way of saying <laughs> well, there, there uh, are things that are probably worth paying for, and then there are things right. that are clearly not worth paying for. Horse armor is not yeah. worth paying for. Binding of Isaac's additional shit, yeah, probably worth paying for. So, so here's here's something to think about though. So, in the case of Resident Evil Seven, the game has not been out very long at all. It's got two DL, DLC packs. You know, like how 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 soon is too soon? And and when thinking about that, these DLC packs are not necessarily part of the main story. So, would it even make sense to include them on launch? As what, like a bonus feature? Well, they have and an extras a, tab. They have a mechanism in the game that they pro- they may have been able to incorporate it in a way, kinda. Mm-hmm. With, I mean, it, it's in the demo. I'm not afraid of saying it. The VHS concept. I won't go any deeper, but I feel they could yeah. have incorporated some if they wanted. Okay, but it's. <laughs> That's just a fuck ton of money right out uh, the gate, though. Appearances really, really, really do a number for this. So if they were to release these at, you know, two months out and then four months out, no one Uh would have this complaint. Literally no one would care. But the fact that this game has just come out and there's already 35 bucks worth of shit you you can buy Mm -hmm. throws people off. Whether or not it's worth it. It's the appearance. And, and believe it or not, a lot of game design, a lot of what we think about these companies comes down to marketing and the way they carry themselves in the marketplace. And the way, yeah. you know, Resident Evil is doing it right now doesn't look that up to par, right? EA tying DLC to physical objects, it looks really fucking shady. It, it, looks, it looks just bad, just anti-consumer all the way. S- so if Resident Evil 7's DLC was done before it released anyway, but they decided to wait two months between releasing each DLC, that would be more preferable? Even think, though it's already been completed the same time it, it's already completed now? It gets down to the I, point where really it makes no difference, it just appears yeah. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it, it would, appears it better. It definitely looks better. But, but in this way, they're saying, okay, so... You've already beat Resident Evil 7. It's a story-based game. Probably not a whole lot of replayability. People are still excited about it. They just played it. They love it. They want more of it. Here's the DLC we already have done. It's it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you don't release it right away, you're not going to get the majority of the would-be sales. But if you do release it right away, you're going to get called out for selling out or, or, you know, price gouging people. And that's why you do a season pass. You throw 40 bucks and you say you're getting all the shit. Because right then now you you're have, paying 35 have, bucks right now in the first three weeks for 35 bucks. But then you have people like Adam and I who are saying, hey, we don't pre-order anything because it very well might. It might as well be No Man's Sky all over again where we're buying yeah. absolute dog shit for 60 bucks. And guess and no, what? You're not their audience for the DLC either. So they and, really and, don't give two shits because you're not going to buy the DLC anyway. I can't believe yeah. they're selling anything. 
Uh, they they already sold you half of a game. Not that they're going to sell you half of the DLC, but that's an entirely different rant that I could go yeah. on later. But you know, Adam, for Adam and I, we're not going to buy the season pass because we don't know if it's going to be good or not, right? If mm-hmm. you know later when the DLC comes out and we hear that, hey, this is actually pretty good, we'll go and plunk down the money like mm-hmm. I did with Wolfenstein, um, well, which was released as a whole separate game, which was kind of weird. Yeah. But I mean, I've bought DLC on the launch day of that DLC without reading reviews first. It's not necessarily about that, but with the season pass, you don't know what you're getting. They, they don't tell you what specifically the DLC is, at least uh, when a DLC releases, I can look at the video on Steam. I can read the description of it. You know, what is it going to be? What does it entail? Does this sound interesting? Yes. Uh, in the case of uh, Outlast, there's a, there's a whistleblower DLC I ended up buying. But the DLC came out quite a bit after the game came out, and I bought it thinking, yeah, I liked Outlast, I had fun with it, I'll play this DLC, it'll be more of that. But the 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 newness of me playing Outlast had already gone away, and at that point I was just not as interested in it. And if I would have had that DLC right after I completed Outlast, I would have been more motivated to actually play through it. Like a lot of things in the gaming industry, I don't think there's there's a clear right or wrong to oh, yeah. any DLC question at all. I mean, we could hash this out all day. It, we're we're all going to feel one way or another, and even me, you know, my feelings are are not at all completely accurate, even for myself. You mm-hmm. know, I've bought season passes before, uh, and I I have liked some of them. I have regretted some of them, and I've got a general feeling about them, but. I don't think there's any way to really, truly win uh, this in in terms of perception, value, and and sales. Yeah. That said, DLC is not going anywhere, right? This makes enough money and is enough of a profit center for these game companies that it's going to keep being a thing. The only thing that should never be a thing is $5 per NES game. What the fuck, Nintendo? They're goddamn NES games. They're like <laughs> six kilobytes a piece. Get over yourselves. Charge a dollar. And DLC is not going away, and it's not evil. It's really not. No. But either way, unless it's pay to win. Yeah, but that's that's different. That's a uh, that's, that's, that's a whole new conversation. That doesn't count. Everybody knows that's evil. <laughs> that's that's the whole freemium. Fucking! I don't even know if I want to consider that fucking DLC. I want to call that the whole freemium model in general. That's a whole different yeah. ball game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's all we got for you this week, though. Um, Tom, I think you actually had a gaming fact. I did, and I totally forgot about it. Okay. So you all know, and I, I apologize because this is going to be video, but I can make this work for audio too. You all know uh, the good old fashioned Nintendo Entertainment System, right? It's big, it's bulky, it plays uh, no games, it doesn't give a fuck, it just plays awesome NES games. Um, so this is the classic front loading NES, where, as you can see, you front load your games. Ta da! But did you know? that Nintendo actually put out a second version of the NES. The NES Top Loader. So these are actually... Uh, I, I wouldn't call them rare. They're uncommon. You could probably get one for 50, 60 bucks on eBay or so. Um, I got this one at Arcade Legacy, as a matter mm. of fact, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's got the power buttons kind of like the Super Nintendo does, so you just push them up. Um, it doesn't have as many ports, though, so it's just got an RF out on the back. Um, does not have the serial connector uh, on the bottom or the expansion port. But what it does have is the connector on the top doesn't wear out like the old ones. You know how you have to blow in these games and, and you know, try to put them in a hundred different ways to try to get it to work? This one doesn't have that problem so much. So, load it in, and it works. Now, this title actually relates to this gaming fact. Did you know Super Glove Ball is the only made for Power Glove game. Like, this came out because of the Power Glove. This is the only one to be released out of the, I believe, three that were being developed at the time. <laughs> I swear you're trying to artificially elevate the need for or the desire for people to buy a Power Glove 
because goddamn, hey. you're the only one I know who ever talks about that power glove. That was hey, such hey, a man, look, <laughs> don't, don't knock my don't knock my Mattel stock, okay? I've got I've got kids to feed. I, I don't really have kids. I've got rabbits to feed. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> but, that's a but seriously, bet. super glove ball. And if you don't have a power glove, uh, it's not good. I mean, even if yeah. you do have a power glove, it's still not good, but it's even less good if you don't have one. It's proof mm-hmm. that Nintendo's been doing gimmicky hardware since 1989. Yeah. Yep. But that, uh, uh, that top load in NES is much smaller. Oh, it is. It is absolutely tiny. So this, it's probably, I, and again, I'm trying to, trying to make this okay for our, our audio people, too. Uh, it's probably literally about half the size. So if we take yeah. a look at this big NES, I mean, look at this thing. It's way thinner. It's got a way, way smaller footprint. Uh, literally half the size, maybe, maybe two thirds the size. Half. Yeah. So wonderful, and it works great. And do you know why the original NES? Do you know what that part's called that actually breaks down and makes your game stop working? <laughs> the seventy-two, 72 pin, pin connector. connector. Damn right. <laughs> and with that tongue-in-cheek reference, we are going to call it a week. You can get at us any way you would like to let us know what you think, any questions, any concerns, or just a fucking bitch at us for stupid shit. Um, you can tweet at us at 72PC Podcast. You can send us an email at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com. Website of 72pinconnector.com. And you can go to our YouTube at 70... It is 72pinconnector all the shit down at the bottom right. If you are looking at this YouTube on any of our random content that we have there, you also can watch us live Friday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern time on our Twitch channel of twitch.tv slash 72 pin connector. And that's all we got for you this week. So until next week, game on. Bye. The donut is already filled with sugary shit. And then you have icing on top of that, but that's not sweet enough. So let's cover the whole thing in that stupid right. way. It's what fucking. Like-